Welcome back, everyone, to part four of the uh, Freedom Doc webinar series. I'm your host, Adam Habig, in association with Lean Frontiers. Freedom HealthWorks proud to present uh, the fourth installment of our direct-to-consumer uh, medicine uh, series. And just to, to reset a bit, uh, because today's topic is, is really interesting, and, and it sounded like from some of the questions that we received, um, might have been a bit uh, intriguing to a lot of you. So to level set the intent of this web series, uh, remember this is really about describing the impact that, that going back to a direct-to-consumer model or, or using a direct-to-consumer model applied to medical care, applied to healthcare as we know it, looking at the impact that can have and how that might be rolled out. And the, um, the first episode, we'll, we'll recap these in, in uh, detail, uh, was a little more broad-based in terms of the impact of direct-to-consumer medicine. Um, the second episode and the third episode were very uh, clinician-focused, kind of in the weeds uh, in, in terms of some of the, the distinctions uh, that we see. But this one really backs the lens out again to a wider view uh, in terms of how direct-to-consumer medicine impacts a very critical part of the healthcare equation. So we've got a couple of great guests today. I'm really excited to hear what they say. Uh, but today's topic, building a local direct care micro network. Uh, and a lot of you had questions as to simply what is a micro network and how does that, yeah, and how does that impact the direct to consumer medicine uh, movement. But the subtitle there, how going direct to consumer removes the barriers to high value care coordination really hints at what that we're focused on here, that, that coordinating care uh, among multiple participants is critical to great outcomes and uh, really a great consumer experience. So just to recap a bit, again, thank you all for joining us today. Um, the Freedom Doc webinar series, uh, ser a series of short lunchtime webinars really meant to educate, evaluate, help interested parties move forward. We start broad, we narrow in on subject matter, and we have interesting guest speakers. And today I know that's um, certainly uh, going to be the case. How to get the most out, be sure to ask questions. We do appreciate your Q&A, your feedback. Uh, email us after the show um, and tune in. And, and these are all provided uh, by Lean Frontiers after the fact, so you can catch up uh, anytime you'd like. So if this is your, uh, if you've been with us the whole time and I see some, some repeat offenders in the attendee list, great, welcome back. If this is your first time with us today, this is a, a brief chapter and verse uh, in terms of how the Freedom Doc series has transpired. So I mentioned that first episode, we talked about uh, direct consumer medicine in general. Um, look, it's, it's, a, it's a revolutionary concept. It shouldn't be, but it, it is based on where we are today. Uh, it's making medical care accessible, affordable, and convenient again. Second episode, we talked about two variants of direct to consumer medicine, really concierge versus direct care and how those differ. And then the last episode, we talked about thriving in independent practice. And that was very, very focused at the um, kind of the ground level for clinicians. Um, but really the, the takeaway was how this is making independent medicine viable again. So today we're going to back the lens out, like I said, talk about micro networks and how direct care enables micro networks to flourish and remove those barriers to high value care coordination that uh, often get in the way today. To recap in detail, and, and I'm going to move quickly, so uh, if you've been with us before, you'll, you'll notice these are key points that we go over, but the key components, for those of you that are new to the, uh, the series, the key components of direct-to-consumer healthcare, pricing clarity, convenience of on-demand services, and fully focusing clinicians on critical issues, not distracting their expertise uh, with admin uh, with, with, with paper shuffling, that kind of thing. The takeaways from that first episode, really that borrowing successful innovations from other industries can help heal America's ailing medical system. We see this often, uh, but cross-pollination from what works in other consumer service industries is critical. And adopting those best practices is really uh, revolutionizing the way healthcare is rolled out to consumers. Uh, the second takeaway, to lower the cost, you must first know the price. We're going to see that again today when we talk about micro networks and the key to succeeding uh, in building these. Um, 
The third under the key takeaways, eliminating barriers to access drives consumer satisfaction. We hit this one over and over again. Again, another key theme we're going to see with the micro networks discussion today is how we eliminate those barriers and watch consumer satisfaction rise. Uh, and then the fourth, and, and this uh, is really a, an underlying thread throughout these episodes, is that insurance, it's a great financial instrument, but it's the wrong currency for most medical care. I think we'll see that arise again today in the uh, micro network discussion. Briefly on, on episode two recap, really all you need to take away from this is concierge medicine, fantastic innovation. Um, direct care is the flavor that we tend to prefer because concierge still has one foot in the traditional insurance-based system. So the takeaway there, both offer great consumer service. Um, only direct care really offers you know, a complete um, removal, elimination of the barriers that come along with insurance-based medicine. Um, and then concierge price, uh, prices are typically a little bit higher than direct care. Episode three, this is mainly for our clinician uh, audience today, uh, but four major takeaways to thrive in direct care. Independent practice is again viable with this model. Uh, be sure you know the difference between thriving and merely surviving. Uh, that's a big key that, that many docs trip up on um, and, and it really affects the, the degree to which they find the model appetizing. Um, number three, focus on the vital few outsource the rest. Anybody from the business community joining us today is going to recognize that key takeaway. Uh, focus on your vital few, outsource the rest. I think uh, Dane is going to have some, some key points of wisdom on that point as well. Time is money. Time lost is costlier than you think. I think that's true in business, in life, in, in, in anything, but tip, especially with, with focus on our direct-to-consumer medicine, uh, time lost is costlier than you think. So again, focus on the vital few. And then number five, no practice or business is an island. Important that you have uh, a supportive community, a network around you, uh, even if you are independent, which that is a great segue into today's discussion. And we like to lead with these takeaways. So I will briefly share these and then we're gonna let our, our guests really expound on today's takeaways. But if you take away anything, here are your crib notes from today. Micro networks of localized, coordinated medical professionals are critical for optimal patient outcomes and satisfaction. And we're gonna talk about what those are, but they are critical. High performing micro networks involve unfettered communication between professionals, clear handoffs and follow-ups, persistent patient advocacy and transparent pricing, critical. Building one of these micro networks is critical to evaluating the value of care. And here's a takeaway, um, large integrated hospital networks have been among the worst performers. We'll talk about why that's the case. And then fourth, when micro networks are complementary, you see quality and efficacy of care increase and costs decline. So those are our takeaways today. I wanna to introduce our featured speakers and then uh, we'll let them uh, take the mic from here on out, but two great minds that approached this from really different perspectives. So it will be interesting to hear their thoughts. Uh, Dane Delosier, our own chief operating officer at Freedom Health Works, um, has spent a career in the realm of um, really what Lean Frontiers focuses on, Dane. Um, mm -hmm. And I'll let you expound on that. But over 25 years in, in the marketplace across several different industries, finding those efficiencies that, that really enable um, businesses and entire industries to elevate their deliverable to their customers. And uh, we're glad to have him on the show today to um, talk about how this impacts uh, really his, his core mission. Uh, also, Kevin Day. Kevin, welcome to the show. Uh, Community-based pharmacist in Cincinnati. Really, you know, sh going to show us how one of these micro networks is built and operates in a boots on the ground sense. And he comes to us from the pharmacy community. So again, a different perspective from a clinical sense, but I think you're going to enjoy uh, what they have to say today. So uh, gentlemen, thank you for joining us today. And uh, I'll move right into our first slide to kind of keep the movement uh, or keep the, the show moving along, but micro networks, um, what are they and why are they important? Dane, we'll go to you first. Well, um... I, I, in preparing for this, um, kind of came to this very simple idea 
that uh, not only, you know, what are they, um, but um, how they came about. The, uh, the fact of the matter is they, they, they came about because that's just the way it was in history, right? You lived in a small town. There was a small community of folks that were serving each other with all their various needs. And that complementary system really worked. And um, so um, what's interesting is that um, we kind of got away from that. And um, that isn't just necessarily a geographically, but it, uh, it still is a small group of folks that come together, um, each bringing their, their value stake, if you will, um, and um, offering their part. So um, I might pause there a moment. I have a few um, thoughts as we go, but uh, Kevin, you're welcome to chime in as well, if you like. Yeah, for sure. Thanks so much for having me, guys. And Adam, thanks for recapping for those newbies like me uh, <laughs> to this little series. I appreciate kind of where we've been to get here. And I love having this conversation right after the one about um, the viability of independence. So I refer to myself and my pharmacy as a community-based pharmacy, but those outside of the world that I live in might think of me as an, as an independent pharmacy and an independent pharmacist. Um, and that's certainly true. So I, I own the pharmacy that I work in um, and the both pharmacist owner, clinical director, wearer wear of many hats as uh, many of those in the direct care space are um, as well across the medical profession. So what we have, stumbled into a little bit here and work in Cincinnati is this realization that I think is probably understood, but really got expanded on of the systems being such poor houses of communication and collaboration, even when everybody in the system is supposedly under the same roof and it should be easy to communicate and collaborate because it doesn't happen very well. And I think all of us I'm sure have either personal or patient stories of, um, individuals that are beat up by the system uh, from a patient perspective trying to go through that care series. So the idea of direct primary care and direct care in general where uh, a patient can have a single person or a very very small team to take care of most of their needs is great except for the fact that there are needs that that individual can't take care of, right? So um, we take care of a lot of really complex medical patients, regardless of where they fall uh, for the rest of their care and are a really viable and valuable part of that patient's team. And, and we know that and our, and our physician partners know that as well. Um, there are others who we need on our teams, right? And this is where the kind of concept grows of, it needs to grow a teeny bit farther. Um, there are often times where I want stat labs as a pharmacist, right? Because patients asking me about a new drug interaction and you know I, we don't know right we can't find that out but trying to go through the system is potentially expensive almost for sure opaque i can't legally send them there because i'm not a referring provider you know all the issues that come up with the system so having a small lab would be a great thing to, you know to add in so that we can just work through these on a very patient specific and patient focused level every issue that comes up if you have the right people around the team and the communication channels open, you can just blow through all of those issues um, really, really conveniently uh, and be able to take care of the patients the way we all want to be taking care of our patients. That's great. I, um, you know, I liken this sometimes, especially for our non-clinical audience today, um, when I think of the, the, the idea of a micro network, you know, the, the, the delivery of care is somewhat, uh, there's an analogy with a supply chain in terms of what you need, when you need it for particular needs. And uh, when you look at what you're both describing um, with, a, with a, a direct care, kind of, kind of direct primary care quarterback, there's all these other pieces that have to fit. And that's what we're calling the micro network. And you've kind of alluded to a couple, um, pharmacy, labs, imaging, specialists, you know, surgical procedures. There's all these things that, that you know, have, have tended to, on the surface at least, become integrated within healthcare. But that integration has not necessarily worked, as you alluded to, Kevin. And so just to kind of definitionally back up, that, that is my perspective of what a micro network looks like. And it's having those, you know, that connective tissue in place without the barriers, without the misaligned incentives that sometimes, you know, can trip up, as you termed, Kevin, the, you know, the, the outcomes from that micro network. But is that, is that a fair definitional description of, of what you see as, as the micro network uh, optimized? It, yeah. It, it, sorry, go ahead, Kevin. 
I was just going to say yes so, and throw it to Dane and see if he had other thoughts. So throw it to you, Dane, see if you have other yeah, thoughts. Yeah, no. Um, so yeah, definitely. And I think there's even something more deeply personal that happens in this. So when we talk about micro networks and a localized focus, um, you know, you let's just take, so let me back up a second. So one of the things that um, really got us to the real value of a micro network was some work that Freedom Health Works um, is doing with CPESN. And for those who don't know it, CPESN is an organization of pharmacists that are advocating for better care. And you can go look them up and, and get details there. But um, what we what we've recognized is is there's a journey from the physician to the you know to the wellness um, path to the pharmacist and back again, and probably even in some cases as conditions may be complex, circular, right? That they go back and forth on a number of occasions. What happens is something really virtuous. They understand, they know each other very deeply. Um, there's a better intimacy. And um, that is true of, yes, people who need help and have complex conditions, but it is also true of people who are healthy. In other words, they know um, that little community or that micro network becomes knowledgeable enough that there's even the ba valuable benefits of early detection, even in healthy people of things that we, you know, wouldn't otherwise detect in our current system. So um, I think what's interesting or what we're learning really quickly is, is that it just goes deeper. And, um, you know, these, these the micro networks that are forming, um, as Kevin and I work together a little bit um, in, in introducing primary care physicians to pharmacists and um, initiating the micro network, there's something really virtuous that happens there. So you, you alluded to this and the, kind of the second bullet point on this, this slide, why are they so critical? Uh, you know, we've talked about the fact no practice is an island and, and these, in order to, for clinicians to deliver the, the higher value uh, from, from medical care, from care delivery today, it really does involve drawing in and drawing on that expertise that, that exists outside the four walls of their particular practice, whether you're in pharmacy, whether you're in primary care, you know, regardless. And Dane, to your point, one of the things that we, we really enjoy at the, prim the direct primary care level is that, um, that notion that uh, a, a clinician who is very familiar with the patient um, through repeated contact and, and, and over the course of, of months and years is always going to be better positioned to deliver better value care to whether it's early detection, whether it's, you know, patient advocacy, those types of things we're going to see on the next slide. But um, as far as the, the, you know, reinforcing that importance, it sounds like that extends, um, you know, beyond uh, the four walls of any practice. And, and you need this sort of a, of a um, foundational support network uh, across specialties, subspecialties, right? Absolutely. Yeah, it's humbling to accept the fact that we can't do all of this, but can't do all of this, right? Our, our aspects of all sorts of things for every patient and every situation where we need help for certain circumstances and having that built in advance of who is who you're going to call um, for that help for those circumstances, even if they're rare, having it set up in advance in clear, concise communication ways is solving issues across the board. So let me ask you, Kevin, to follow up on that. Why then, before we look at how we go about assembling these, why have the purportedly most integrated, you know, larger networks, hospital networks struggled? Uh, and I've got kind of the answer there, but it has to do with incentives being misaligned. But why, why have you seen that not work at the, the large hospital level, whereas direct care, um, this works? Yeah, I think the incentives and misalignment there is certainly a factor. It, it probably is the answer underlying, but even on a frontline level, they, these health systems are in the existing system and an existing system that is at some level, at least volume-based, those frontline providers are so crushed for time. And most of what we're asking about takes a little bit of time. So if choice A is to not call me and just send 25 prescriptions without any information about a patient, and choice B is to pick up the phone for a three minute conversation, 
they don't have three minutes, um, right? Oftentimes, and, or at least they don't think they do. And that's where, you know, the pressure, this is where the incentive is not aligning, applies the pressure to it, but it, it just cuts out any sort of non-billable extraneous communication most frontline providers feel like they can't give. Um, at least that's been my experience. And that's true for pharmacists. It's true for um, docs. It's certainly true for transitions of care coordinators, you know, at point of discharge. Um, they have what's what's billable and what they're supposed to do. And to go that extra step interferes with their ability to do the next billable thing that they're supposed to be doing. Um, and there's just no ability and, and, and push to do those things that are good for patients that don't have a code attached to them or they don't have any metrics attached to them. Whereas conversely, under a direct care model, you remove the pressure to practice by billing code, as we call it, you have more time. And, and really your incentive is, is always focused on the best outcome. And that's why I term that as in, in terms of value, but really the best outcome and value delivered to your patient, your customer. Exactly. Yeah, I, I would use it in terms of, you know, a lean perspective, it's eliminating non value adding things in a process flow or a value stream that needs to happen where it's really critical. Um, you know, um, Adam alluded, you alluded to it earlier about my lean background, but, um, you know, it, it, there's a resistance or a general resistance to look at the world of healthcare like lean. Yet lean has some fantastic attributes and some amazing things to bring to all this. It is looking at that journey, that patient or that client journey and saying, all right, what needs to happen? What, you know, what doesn't need to happen? And, you know, what's waste, classical sources of waste, right? Well, they're all over the current process or system, you know, that the patient lacking information at the wrong time or, you know, not having the information they need at the right time or um, seeing the wrong person at the wrong time, showing up at the wrong visit at the wrong time, right? The scheduling, extra lead time because the capacity of the hospital system isn't there, right? That, you know, that, that they're fairly reliant on the model, particularly that requires this 15 minute interval um, itself probably means that we're not processing enough or effectively enough each time to eliminate the need for further processing later. So just to use some lean perspective in that, that, that topic, um, it, you know, you have disparate large influences with um, uncommon interests, if I could say it that way or be that brash. And um, someone needs to be looking at the entire value stream map. Well, that just really happens naturally and very, very easily when you do what we're describing here in terms of micro networks. Perfect. We know we want them. We know they work. We know they're great. Um, but let's look at some of those attributes on this next slide that make them successful. And Dane, to kind of follow up on what you were saying, these are um, some of those, those, those touch points, those handoff points, those inflection points within any sort of a system that involves you know, complex multiple uh, entities kind of working on parallel paths. I think we see a lot of these, these crop up. Uh, so what makes these networks successful? And I'd like to hear from both of you on this one. Kevin, you wanna go first? Sure, sorry, I'm typing an answer to Dr. Sawyer's question too. So uh, maybe we'll get to both of these at the same time. Um, to me, the, the success is, is driven by open communication um, from and it is a biggest difference of, from my role as somebody not part of the system, right? I'm not owned by one of the health systems or have EMR access to be able to send direct messages necessarily easily by name to anybody across the city in the system. As an outsider to that, it's so ridiculously difficult um, to get clarifications, to suggest ideas, to correct mistakes, um, you know, everything in that regard. So if I have a patient standing in front of me that I take a blood pressure here in this room and it's 160 over 110 and I want to get a hold of a doc about, you know, hey, heads up um, and maybe adjust the med, I'm calling a, probably a medical assistant who's not on site at the office and that she's taking my notes and retyping them to send a message to another medical assistant who is on site at the office, who's reading her notes to convey them to the physician. 
who then is sending it back through that chain the other direction, right? And there's like eight points of contact in that piece. What we've developed here in a couple of circumstances is um, using some HIPAA secure technology that is available outside. And I won't, I'm not gonna leave it out here. It doesn't matter necessarily. There's plenty of choices. None of them are great, but like I just got the message directly from a physician to me um, as a pharmacist about a change in the medicine and what we wanna do and a plan about how we're gonna propose it to the patient, um, right? Like skipping the other eight steps, all of a sudden we got to exactly what we needed to get to. Um, so that's where I think that is the far and away best option. Um, or the most important piece to making me successful is having that ability to communicate freely, openly, openly securely, um, and back and forth, right? Bi-directional has to go both ways. I think I, think I would add that um, I heard quite a few sources of waste in what you just described, right? <laughs> so it, there it is. Um, you know, um, to the employers out there, I, just a quick comment, um, you know, it makes something like this successful. Um, I'm gonna share with the group, um, maybe Adam, there's some way we can post this out to people, but um, I ran across recently um, a Journal of American um, uh, Medical Association, the JAMA uh, group um, in April of 2020, it's a pretty long title, so that's why we'll post it and make it available um, or accessible to folks. But it's utilization and cost of employer-sponsored comprehensive primary care um, delivery model. Um, and I'm not going to go into that tons. That's not what we're here for. But what was interesting to me about that was um, they actually, it was probably one of the most significant um, statistical samplings that I've run across now where they had 23,500 folks participating. These were employer patients and they were being, um, uh, two groups were juxtapositioned to one another as a control group and a test group. And um, what they found is, is that strong localized care, um, near site, on site, you know, the attributes of this micro network that we describe and the elimination of this waste resulted in you know, fewer emergency room visits and you know, um, fewer um, expensive procedures because this, you know, your care providers, whether it's your pharmacist or the people that are a part of this network that know you as a patient, they, it's back to that leading indication, right? They pick up on something early and they're actually able to mitigate the risk of an emergency room visit. And so what was interesting about the study, they talk about a number of um, demographic groups, uh, but you know, some of those demographic groups are saving, you know, by, by um, building that localized care that they're actually driving a per head count or per capita cost um, down by as much as 40% in some of those groups. So it's a very interesting study and it's, it's the first real, um, uh, I shouldn't say that. There's lots of studies out there about, about direct primary care and or localized care, but um, it was one of the most significant statistical samplings that I had run across and um, pretty compelling. And what I really loved is, is that they're planning to do some more studies. So it's certainly something I intend to follow. 40%. That's a big number, Dan. Huge. Yeah. You, I think you, we all know there's all the cost we drive into that system today. No wonder we're two and a half times the rest of the world on care. Yeah, and I think these, these bullet points in terms of what makes these micro networks successful, these are just words. And I'm sure a lot of groups will profess to exhibit these practices, but it's really not possible to the level that direct to consumer medicine allows these things to be manifest. And that's one thing I wanna drive home. It just, you know, the unfettered communication that Kevin talks about, the clear handoffs and the follow-ups, we say no lost sheep, you know, being aligned so that you're always as a clinician, a persistent patient advocate uh, without any sort of competing incentives. And that, again, I think as Kevin mentioned earlier, that's, that's not the clinician's fault in the, in the traditional system that that's the case, but only by removing um, those distortions that occur from a third party payer being in the middle, can you actually become a true patient advocate? And then transparent pricing goes part and parcel with that. I mean, it, it really, as a, even as a, as a clinician, as a non-clinician, as a, you know, a, a stakeholder in this, unless you can see what things cost, it's very, very difficult to achieve a high value deliverable. That's just goes without saying, but 
Uh, the last point there before we move on to, and, and look at the mailbag and want to keep an eye on the time for everybody, but um, it just reiterates what we said. Eliminate impediments and allow these micro networks to emerge. Um, and, and the result, as Dane said just now, can be, can be stark. So I'll move us along to the FAQs. And I, before we get into these, uh, as we were looking at these, and we really appreciate the feedback and some of the questions in advance that people had, uh, forgive us in advance if our answer to many of these is, well, that's something that we're working, uh, that we do at Freedom Health Works. Not meant to be a broken record with that, but because this is a point of, of critical need for clinicians in the space, a lot of these items we've identified and, and there are areas that we provide solutions. So there's a disclaimer in advance, but here's a good one. Um, how do I build one of these? We've talked about how critical they are, how important they are. Um, how do I go about doing this? So I'll start from the I'll start from the clinician kind of prospect. Um, to me, if there are docs in whatever community that are frustrated with the way that the area pharmacies are working with them, so I taught residents recently, right? And most medical residents concept of pharmacy is if a pharmacy is on the phone, the only purpose for that call is what did I screw up now um, type perspective, right? Or why do you still need this refill? I sent it already. Um, it, we can flip that and we should flip that on its head, right? There are, there are insights that your pharmacy friends have about your patients that nobody else in the system has because we hear things all the time because we're really close to them a lot, uh, a lot more than most docs. The DBC docs are with their patients a ton but I still see them a lot. Um, and I see in their houses, you know, where does everyone in that regard? So if a dog wants to build a relationship with a pharmacy uh, is to walk into the pharmacy. Um, they almost always open longer than you are. So you can go without interfering your workday too much. And it doesn't interfere our workday that much. Uh, it might feel like it does, but if a doc walks in here, like I'll drop everything to go talk to, I would drop you guys. If somebody knocked on my door and said, there's a doc here to see you, right? I would just be like, all right, bye, <laughs> like, gotta go. Um, so that to me is that first way and start to learn about what pharmacies do. Because again, I think from my perspective, right, is we don't under, we don't do a good job selling our own services. That's on us. Um, I think that's also true for others in the healthcare system, right? Is we don't always know what is being offered out there in the world because we do get head down, even if we're not trying to, or really trying to do the opposite, we still get stuck in our little bubble. Um, and you might not recognize that there are these services that are being offered around you for free or very inexpensively that might be life-changing for your patients and life-changing for your practice, right? If you can offload certain things that are not your expertise or um, desire to do, give them to somebody else. There's probably, there might be somebody right down the street who's doing that. So um, to try to just find them and, and introduce yourself and go from there. I think as that builds up, it gets a little bit harder. And, and Dan, I'd love to hear your feedback on operationalizing one of these kind of into the business community and what that looks like too. Yeah, Dane, and I've got um, a couple of follow-ons that might uh, inform, you know, kind of that that next piece. But yeah. um, go ahead. I'd love to hear your piece on on you know sourcing and, and operationally how you you stitch one of these things together, and and that it's not necessarily always local, frankly. Right. So um, yeah, I think my initial reaction is seek out the dissonance. Um, you know, anywhere there's someone motivated to do something differently, they're probably being vocal, they're probably making themselves um, visible. Um, and, and maybe it's just looking in some of the right places. But I love that um, Kevin and CPESN, CPESN have done, um, even with us and some of the work where, um, you know, we are both associations, right? Um, we are a, are a fairly large group each of our stakeholders and our doors are standing wide open. So that's one way, um, but there are lots of informal ways. Um, there are face groups that are Facebook groups that are um, forming um, around the subject. There's, you know, there's quite a bit on DPC in terms of communities that um, have uh, popped up um, left and right. You, it doesn't take a lot of searching to find those groups and um, Wow, if anything has happened over the last 18 months, um, it has been the world opening to Zoom and virtualization of networking. Um, you know, uh, just for myself, um, you know, in, in a LinkedIn capacity, um, 
a network that was kind of unattended to went from 500 connections to 2000 for me over the, you know the last 18 months well you know so it's it's just saying yes and opening up your your uh, you know your doors so to speak wherever you're communicating and where you're reaching socially um but uh maybe that's i'll stop there adam i know we have some other topics we want to jump into yeah, yeah. um but but i my, my key point there is seek out the dissonance it, and it isn't all dissonance look for the people who are most um vocal and uh just talk to them because they're really open um i found this community to be exceptionally um welcoming um sort of being the new guy on the block and i i love the fact again i emphasize that you know the the the, the since the world has gone virtual and here we are on a, on a virtual you know on a webinar a virtual channel um there are avenues that have now opened up and i know at freedom we're working on one that we were rolling out where you know you actually can connect for consults with various specialists remotely um, on behalf of your patients. And, and so there's a way that, you know, local, we're stretching the definition of local and down the street would be great, but sometimes, you know, better value is working with someone that is not just down the street and, and finding kind of a one-to-many relationship is, is important to unlocking those types of, of opportunities. I'm going on to number two. Um, and you really hit on this and, and maybe you can add as a doctor, how do you network with other local uh, direct care um, really doctors and, and, and participants in this micro network world. Yeah. To me, that's just, you know, walking in the front door sometimes, right? Just again, opening yourself up to it. Um, stick, stick, stick yourself out there a little bit if you, you know, um, and that, I would say that to administrators, I would say that to employers, I would say that to pharmacists, physical therapists, nurse practitioners, right? Um, we, you know, I think that so much of history, you know, our current system is influenced and has been created by very naturally occurring, but large forces. And, um, you know, it conditions you to approach it in a very classical way, when in fact, you have a choice every day, you know, where you choose to spend your dollars, where you choose to go network and put your energy. And I would tell you that um, many of the stakeholders in this community have a lot of influence. Um, take doctors, take pharmacists, any one of those constituent groups, take specialists. Um, you know, as a group, there's shortages of all of them. And there's a lot of influence about, you know, how you want to do what you do. Sure. Here were a couple of follow-ons to that. And um, again, these are, we are running a bit short on time guys. So keep an eye on the clock, got about four minutes left. But any tips for, uh, you know, professionals, clinicians who are um, isolated geographically or perhaps in a rural setting where there just aren't many choices out there. Uh, and then for specialists looking to also build their own micro networks for uh, referrals and, and otherwise. Kevin, any, any tips there? Uh, whoever is on the island, literally just call somebody like me who lives in Ohio in the middle of winter, and I'll probably put a pharmacy on the <laughs> island. Um, oh, that's only mostly a good idea. So <laughs> I, I think there's a recognition, and we, and we sort of get to this, right, is if you are in a like in a physical space where it feels like an island is, are you sure, right? And, and are you, have, you, have you unturned gone around all those rocks um, to make sure because there are a lot of professionals that are stuck and frustrated and, and want to get off so um i think that to keep looking is it, that sounds cliche because you might be if you're not is to look and think about people who are willing to work with you um from farther away so you know we take care of patients who live very far away from here because they have a delivery driver who lives very far away from here right so we end up our delivery radius is this little circle with a long spire um, that he can take on his way home. So we, we can be creative with that if we have the right places. I think a lot of people are willing to be creative for the right collaborations um, and, and feel free, right? If we're in a direct care model, we don't have to follow the norms that have existed in the traditional care model. So if we can blow them up, let's blow them up. That, again, that sounds bad, but I think we need to be open to that. You know, I often have conversations with 
um, independent docs who are trying to do things that are very much written by the insurance companies. And it, it's, we don't even realize what's written by the insurance companies anymore. So um, from my perspective, at least, and if we can break through those, let's break through those when we can. Right on. Perfect. Yeah, jump out of the rut. You know, it, it's not limited to state lines. It's not limited to, you know, a, a micro network, um, even localized. Localized is, you know, connected and informed, I would say, are two key attributes. And so, um, you know, we've got a doc right over there by Kevin, um, you know, working with a pharmacist that's just four minutes away from her office and um, you know, there are specialty procedures that can be done here in Indianapolis. Well, that still is an effective relationship that uh, can happen. And, um, you know, so it doesn't have to be just within 10 miles. So rethink your definition of local uh, right. in terms of geographic uh, proximity. And again, I would encourage not just specialists, but, but even uh, really clinicians of any stripe, you know, plug into a network plug into a larger network like the two that we've, we've talked about today or any other network that gives you one-to-many access. Um, there are a lot of folks like you out there looking for just the same thing you're looking for. So maybe that leads the next question, best tool or methodology employed to build a micro network. It, it sounds like it, it really, there is no silver bullet here, guys. It's an all of the above approach. But um, again, any, anything you'd add to what we just said in terms of redefining locality and plugging into larger associations or larger platforms? The only thing that I would add is to um, try to have a better frame of reference than I probably did when we started these conversations, right? I, again, from a head down, I think I know all the answers. That's probably young blood in me too um, that speaks that out. But a, a lot of healthcare providers have that mentality um, and, and uh, allowing yourself, if you're gonna enter into a space like this, to be really open to ideas and also open to the fact that this might take a while because uh, what you're suggesting might not line up perfectly right away um, with whoever you're trying to, to build that network with. So patience is probably actually important here and willingness to put in some work. I mean, I'm meeting weekly with these docs um, in our kind of group and have been for a year and our work has evolved some, but it's a, a lot of communication about what we can and want to be doing to improve patient care. Fantastic. Uh, we talked about non-competitive markets a bit in terms of just broadening the, uh, the definition of local and, and, and working through, you know, outside of, of a, a isolated pocket that has no competition and therefore fewer options for you. Here's a good one. How do you use micro networks to attract patients into direct care? We get a lot of questions every episode about how to grow a direct care practice. A lot of them at the primary care level, some at the specialty level, which I think specialists are finally going to be given their due in our next episode. I know we bumped that from this one, but I thought it was important to build to that, talking about micro networks and how that then in, in, involves specialists. But how can you attract patients to the direct care model using a micro network? Kevin, I know you've got some, some experience with this um, that's directly on point. Yeah, so we are very open to having conversations about why patients are frustrated with the traditional model. Um, the, when a patient wants to transfer prescriptions to me, I ask them why they're leaving their old pharmacy. Um, sometimes it's because they moved and that's not very often, right? It's, it's because the system is breaking and what that looks like. So if there are ways that we can continue to ask those kinds of questions, whether it's about a pharmacy or a doctor or lab experience or anything in that regard, is to use those as moments of motivation for the patient and needing education about what um, they can find elsewhere if they know where to look. And if we have the resources to provide where to look, uh, then it becomes just really easy, pretty patient in, a, in like a very referred uh, manner for patients to find direct care practices. And so it, re it really becomes another entry point for consumers who are fed up or, or, or aggravated in some way with the, the, the service, the value they're receiving from the traditional system, once they encounter any touch point within a micro network, that is a, a great opportunity to recruit that patient fully into the direct care ecosystem. That's, that's something I know you've, and that's what you just alluded to. That's something that's mm -hmm. happening today. Yep. I would add um, that, uh, you know, Kevin, you alluded to it earlier, that um, healthcare professionals aren't necessarily just naturally wired to, to go do this, right? And we've been in, in, uh, suggesting this a lot, be open to it, go 
stick your neck out there, so to speak. Um, but um, I find myself having conversations frequently with primary care physicians um, around that very subject. And it is really obvious to me, just because I get the benefit of engaging, you know, 40, 50 doctors, um, you know, over a course, uh, that uh, it's not a, it's not a, a sales kind of conversation in any way. It's simply an awareness conversation that you really can um, choose, even if you've got insurance or whatever it is, a traditional, um, you know, healthcare, um, you know, you're part of a group benefits plan. You still can have a relationship with a Kevin. You still can have a relationship with your doctor. Um, and, it, and it's not a costly thing. It, you know, this very efficient model is super effective at, um, you know, eliminating a lot of that waste, but also um, just getting a direct connection and that alone um, enhances or builds a lot of value. Yeah, any any a patient or consumer who sees value at any point in this micro network, whether it's pharma, whether it's a, a you know, a consult with a specialist that precludes an expensive uh, you know, hospital admission or something that they become customers for life and they become customers of, of the ecosystem that, you know, that is direct care. And, and it's a great thing for all of us when those touch points yield more consumers understanding the value. We are out of time, guys. There was a fifth question on here that was really for me as the attorney, stark and anti-kickback implications for practices. I don't have time to really explore that right now, but the follow on was engaging with hybrid practices. And I would tell you that if you are not dealing with hybrid practices that are still uh, have one leg in the insurance world, then the stark and anti-kickback uh, provisions for the most part don't apply and are not a concern. Uh, perhaps a, a, a question for next time when we talk about specialists. Today's takeaways to run through these again, micro networks are critical if we are to achieve higher patient uh, satisfaction, optimal outcomes. High performing networks involve the unfettered communication that Kevin mentioned, the clear handoffs and follow-ups, the persistent patient advocacy and the transparent pricing, critical for success. Building a micro network is critical to elevating the value of care that we deliver to consumers. When these networks are complementary, uh, things are good. Quality's up, costs are down. And direct to consumer medicine is the key to seeing micro networks realize their full potential. So I wanna thank you for joining us today. I apologize if we ran a little bit over. Our guests were fantastic. So I wanted to give them uh, plenty of time to, to uh, expound on their, with their insight. Our next webinar will be August 26th, so a month down the road. Uh, and then our final wrapping it all up will be September 23rd. And then the first freedom.conference, if you've been here before, you've seen this in the past. So thank you for joining us today, Dane. Thank you, Kevin. Appreciate you uh, hanging out with us. Thanks everybody. Until next time, take care. Thank <laughs> you.